Good morning. For those of you that are standing in the back, they're going to bring some additional chairs in. So we'll get some seats for you if you don't want to filter in from the, at the front. So my name's Scott Hilgenberg. I'm the First Armored Division and Fort Bliss Sharp Program Manager. Welcome to the Senior Commander's Sharp Forum. The host for today's summit is Colonel Matthew Eichberg, the Acting Commander, First Armored Division, Fort Bliss. We would like to welcome Dr. John Fobert from Headquarters Department of the Army, Sharp Ready and Resilience Directorate, General Officers, Commanders, Command Sergeants Majors, First Sergeants, El Paso Community Members, Members from UTEP, Department of the Army Civilians, SARCs, and Victim Advocates. Last year, Major General Matlock had the opportunity to see a presentation by Dr. Fobert at the Army Professional Forum. After the forum, General Matlock provided his top sharp issues, continuing to increase the propensity to report, and the issues uh, as two top training priorities were building empathy within our formations and increasing bystander intervention. We all have a role in preventing sexual harassment, sexual assault, and activities such as today's forum are a great way for us to extend that message. After Dr. Fobert's presentation, there will be an opportunity for some questions and answers uh, with Dr. Fobert, as well as time for leader engagement with Colonel Eichberg and Sarah Major. Please join me in welcoming the Senior Commander for First Armored Division of Fort Bliss, Colonel Matthew Eichberg, for his opening remarks. Hey everybody, I just want to say good morning to everyone. Appreciate everyone being here. There's obviously a lot going on. But how do we know, how does anyone know that this is important to us? Because we're taking time as leaders, and we can do a thousand other things, get together here together and spend time talking about this problem. And, and make no mistake about it, it's still a problem. So as much progress as, we, as we've made, this is still a sickness in our formation. It's, it's like a cancer that can eat it, eat it away from the inside out. We can't tolerate it, we have to continue to combat it, and we have to continue to learn. And by learning, uh, we'll be able to do. So Dr. Fulbert, sir, thank you very much for coming all this way out here to help educate and train us. Greatly appreciate it. And what I'd like to remind everyone of is today, it's, there's a dialogue. So it doesn't matter if you're sitting back there or sitting up here, please engage him. Um, people like this don't come out here. Uh, very often, he's all over the place. So please don't hesitate to ask a question, to provide a vignette, anything. And I promise you, not only you, but everyone else will learn. So without further ado, sir, thank you. I hand it over. John Fobert, Ph.D., is the Dean of College of Education at Union University. He's the principal of Dr. John Fobert, LLC, and serves as a highly qualified expert for sexual assault prevention in the U.S. Army. Dr. Fobert founded the national nonprofit One in Four, an organization that works, has worked for 20 years to apply research to rape prevention programs on college campuses, in communities, and in the military. Dr. Fobert entered his undergraduate degree in psychology and sociology from the College of William and Mary, his master's degree in psychology from the University of Richmond, and his PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park. Dr. Fobert is an interdisciplinary scholar with over 50 peer-reviewed publications. He has written seven books about the prevention of sexual violence and two about managing life in college residence halls. How Pornography Harms is his 10th book and the one he hopes will have the broadest appeal to college students, parents, military, and the public at large. His federally funded interdisciplinary research program has produced scholarship that is featured in some of the most respected peer reviews, journals in education, gender studies, and psychology. His grant and government contract work exceeds $1 million, and he was the first scholar to document a reduction in sexual violence resulting from a prevention program. Dr. Fobert has given approximately 300 professional presentations to conferences, universities, community, and military organizations worldwide. In 1998, he and a group of colleagues founded the nonprofit organization One in Four. One in Four is dedicated to ending rape through means shown to be most effective through scientific research. 
in the group's 20 years, over 100,000 people at countless universities, state health departments, and military organizations have seen Dr. Fobert's rape prevention programs. Dr. Fobert has testified and has been called upon by the White House and the Pentagon for his expertise in rape prevention. He consults with colleges and military regularly about the harms of pornography and how to end sexual violence. He has been featured in media including CNN, NPR, the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, as well as US News and World Report. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Fobert. Thank you all very much. I always feel so awkward when someone reads my bio. I don't know about you, but it just seems like they should just say, well, here's John, he knows about sexual assault and let me come up on stage, but that's how we do it. So um, I do appreciate you all being here. What I'm going to do, um, I'll give you an overview about what I'm gonna do, but what I hope you get out of this is a lot of material that you can use with your soldiers to train them about the issues that I'm talking about. So I, I'm hoping that you will steal without mercy, basically, um, the information that I'm going to provide to you. My slides will be made available to you so you, you don't have to write quickly or, or take pictures of the slides, although you can if you want to. Um, but I just want you to know I'm, I don't hold tight to my materials. I hold them with an open hand. And so hope that you all will use them uh, to your heart's content. So where are we headed? I want to give you a little bit of, of statistics about uh, sexual violence in the military, and then I'm going to go into characteristics of perpetrators and those they target. Um, then we're going to talk about what happens in a trauma survivor's brain. I think it can be really helpful to develop empathy with trauma survivors by understanding what's going on in their brain uh, during a, a sexual assault. And then we're going to talk about rape-related PTSD and how that relates to survivor testimony. Because frequently, what rape survivors will do is they'll talk differently about the same incident um, throughout their, their time of recovery. And I want to make sure uh, you understand what those things look like. And then we're going to talk about preventing sexual violence through bystander intervention and the importance of that. And I'm going to have several different times when I ask questions, because I do hope that some of this will be interactive. Despite how many people are here, I'm going to do my best to, to keep you uh, interactive and, and talking. So um, again, thank you. So a few of my assumptions that I wanted to start off with, just to give you a sense of where I come from. Um, I, I like to emphasize that most people who commit rape may be men, but most men don't rape. Because I think frequently people can uh, come across with a perspective that men are these horrible, awful, violent, vile human beings and, and we just need to uh, control them in, in better ways. Well, my perspective is that most men are, are good guys. And it's up to the good guys to intervene uh, when the bad guys are doing what they're doing. And so I, I treat men as people who are not rapists, not people who are. Um, I also believe that ending rape is going to take all of us working together, uh, and it's undermined by pointing fingers at anyone except for convicted rapists. And then finally, um, I'm a data guy. I like to deal with the research, and so when I give an opinion, I like to make sure that it's backed up by scholarly research, and it's not just coming from me, but it's coming from peer-reviewed journals, government studies, those sorts of things. So that's where I'm coming from. And of course, anytime we talk about rape or sexual violence, I want to give a disclaimer that it can be difficult. I mean, we're going to talk about some things that are pretty uh, traumatic. And so I wanted to recognize that from the beginning. You can leave at any time. You can take a break at any time. We will have a break halfway into this time so that you can count on that. But please, above all, just take care of yourselves. So I wanted to start first by having you guess. Uh, and we'll do this by a show of hands. What percentage of people in the military who experience sexual assault are women? So look at how that question's worded. What percent of people in the military at large who experience sexual assault are women? Would it be A, 48%, B, 68%, C, 88%, or D, uh, 98%? So we'll take hands on A. How many of you think it's A? How many of you think it's B? How many of you think it's C? And how many of you think it's D? Okay. Whoops. Yeah, there we go. It's A. Uh, if you take a look at the actual data on the sheer number 
of sexual assaults that take place. Uh, 9,600 um, was the data from a couple of years back, um, the most recent data I was able to get, um, but 10,600 men. Why, would, why do you think that would be that there are more men than women who experience sexual violence in the military? Does anyone have a guess? Yes. There are more men in the military. Thank you. Okay, absolutely. So that's, that's what that comes down to. All right, so how often does it happen in the military? If you take a look at this slide here, uh, sexual assault happens to about 2% of the men, of men in the military every year, 24% uh, of women. So obviously, if you're a woman, you're more likely to be sexually assaulted, but, um, uh, but men do still experience it, and there are more men in the military, so that happens a great deal. Sexual harassment, about 9% of men per year, and about 53% of women. So these are still problems that we have in the military, obviously, that we need to battle. Um, an interesting difference, too, it happens when we look at the statistics on reporting rates. Right now, we're doing a lot better with women uh, in terms of reporting than with men. Um, right now, 43% of women are reporting what happened to them, which is um, way up from how it used to be. We hoped that it would be 100%, but right now it's 43 But with men, it's only 10 um, so we're hoping over time that uh, that number will, will increase and that we actually get to 100% reporting and then eventually get to 0% sexual assault happening. That, of course, being the ultimate goal. So I want to take you through um, a study of military sexual assault survivors. And they were asked in this particular study, was the intent of your assault to humiliate you? So. Um, was humiliation the goal in the sexual assault itself? And I'm curious to know, uh, which do you think was higher? Do you think men uh, would say, more, male survivors would be more likely to say the intent of their sexual assault was to humiliate them? Or do you think that women would be more likely to say that sexual assault was uh, designed to humiliate them? Let's get hands on men, hands on women. Okay, most of you are absolutely correct. 70% um, of men said that the sexual assault they experienced uh, was designed to humiliate them. 42% of women said that the chief goal was to humiliate them. So that's a little bit of data uh, there as well. Now, there's a study of women veterans uh, that came out, and what they found was that more than half were physically or sexually abused before enlisting in the military. And one of the reasons why that's so alarming is that um, one of the top predictors of whether or not someone is going to be sexually assaulted in the future is if they've been sexually assaulted in the past. And so what we're getting in the military is a population of, of, of women who are much more likely to be sexually assaulted than those in the general population, um, which is important. Also, it's important to recognize that a lot of women who come into the military are coming to escape an abusing, abusive rather, or distressing environment. Now, we're not talking about all women who are getting into the military, but many who are coming into the military, more than half um, physically or sexually abused, and nearly all were sexually abused by a parent or step-parent. Um, and so they're escaping environments where they're in danger, and then frequently, well, not frequently, but sometimes they'll enter a new environment um, that can be just as dangerous, which is one of the reasons why it's uh, so traumatic. Now, also before entering the military, about 12% of girls have been raped in high school, and that's not sexual assault, which is a broader category, but it's a more narrow category of rape where penetration would be involved. Um, and about 5% of boys, about 1 in 20 boys, uh, have been raped um, while they've been in high school. The sexual assault statistics are higher than that, um, but this would be girls and boys uh, in high school. Now, what I want to do now is talk a bit about characteristics of perpetrators and characteristics of people they target. Now, I refer to them as characteristics of people they target rather than survivors in this particular uh, section because what I want to emphasize is that there's a certain type of individual that perpetrators are more likely to go after to commit their crime against. Now, does that make it that person's fault that it happened to them? Absolutely not. But there are characteristics that perpetrators tend to look for, and I want to give you a sense of that. And then we're going to transition to talking more about perpetrators themselves. What do we know from the research about what their characteristics tend to be? And I'm going to show you a six-minute video where a perpetrator is interviewed um, so we can pick out a little bit about um, 
what, uh, what his characteristics were. So what did perpetrators target? Um, what are per perpetrators, particularly male perpetrators who are perpetrating against females? What are they looking for? They're looking for someone who has a difficult time being assertive. Why would they want that? Well, they want someone who's not going to resist as strongly. Um, they'll also look for someone who has a delayed response to anger. Uh, that, or excuse me, to danger. Almost anger. Danger. Um, that delayed response to danger can mean that you have a bunch of people at a party, you, there are a bunch of guys who are getting out of hand, and the women who are there, many of them may leave, but the one who, who's more likely to be sexually assaulted may not want to leave, may not feel like it's proper or polite to leave, and may stay a while longer. Um, another characteristic of people who are more likely to be sexually assaulted, women who blame themselves for having experienced sexual assault in the past. They're significant more likely to experience rape in the next four months. So if I say that again, women who blame themselves for being sexually assaulted are significantly more likely to be raped again in the next four months. Now why, why might that be? We don't exactly know, but we do know that there's some trauma reactions that such women have um, that may give off a signal to others that they have been traumatized and they may make for an easy target. Um, this is also another reason why we think it's very important to emphasize that we are, we're supposed to believe survivors um, and we're not supposed to blame them for what happened. Okay? Obviously, if you're in a court-martial, we want to we prove it in a, in a court-martial and um, we, we want to make sure all standards of evidence are followed. Um, but we, we need to make sure that um, we don't blame women for, for this having happened because it actually increases the likelihood they'll experience it again. And then the final two things here, binge drinking frequently, more casual sex, um, that tends to be associated with, you know, women, um, the, the stereotype would be women who are more likely to get into trouble, less likely to be believed. Um, and those are women uh, that male perpetrators seek out more than others. And again, none of these characters, in fact, if someone had all five of these characteristics, it doesn't mean they have been sexually assaulted, but it does mean that they may be uh, more of a target for sexual assault uh, from male perpetrators. Now, what makes perpetration itself more likely? What are, um, what are perpetrators uh, like? The number one thing is that they, the, the number one predictor of whether or not someone's gonna perpetrate rape in the military is whether they perpetrated rape prior to their military service. And I have a times 10 up there uh, because they are 10 times more likely to perpetrate rape than your average soldier um, if they've perpetrated rape before they get into the military. Um, so that's something we don't see in social science research too frequently. The next two items go together. Um, if they drink uh, two or more times a week, and not just like a glass of wine with dinner, but if they're drinking to the point of binge drinking, um, taking in a lot of content of alcohol at least two times a week, and uh, you combine that with the third point, they have a bunch of, of friends who support either emotional, physical, or sexual violence. So. They essentially um, have a bunch of guys who, are, who like to trash talk women, say, oh, well, all women are female dogs, but they don't say female dogs. Um, you know, that, that we're, they're just here for our pleasure, that sort of thing. Let me take a pause um, and ask you the question, what do you think are some successful ways to intervene against trash talking when, when soldiers hear it? What would you tell some of your soldiers um, about ways to intervene to, uh, to stop trash talking when it happens? Uh, sir, I think one of, one of the ways is it's not in the military, it's not within the family, or it's not within that organization. It is not in our culture. Um, we are a family as a team. We need to work as a team and succeed as a team. We don't do this in our family. Okay. We don't do this in our family. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay. Um, why don't we get one more over here? Yes. Oh, no, sir, I didn't have any specific method of doing it. Um, I, I, I appreciate the sort of enculturation of the values, but if you don't have that, the only way to really do that is to just have courage and stand up against it. And I think uh, that's the main thing that all of us need to develop in ourselves. Okay, absolutely. We all need to intervene as bystanders and not just sit by and let things happen. So thank you very much. Let me take a look at the next few three items. Uh, well, actually, hang on one second. 
Items two and three, if you put those together, that man is nine times more likely to commit sexual violence. Okay, someone who drinks to the point of binge drinking two or more times a week and has a lot of peers who support uh, fit different kinds of violence against women, that man is nine times more likely to commit violence. And then items four, five, and six also go together. If you have um, a, a man who ha is very high on what's called hostile masculinity, and I'm not talking about masculinity itself, um, but really hostile masculinity. Someone who might say, I have to prove my manhood by having sex with 10 women on 10 different nights and never know their name. Um, I have to prove my manhood by beating up 10 guys uh, with one arm tied behind my back. Someone who's really hostile, um, that would be hostile masculinity. You combine that with someone um, who's into having impersonal sex, with, which would essentially be sex for simply the physical release of it rather than for the emotional attach attachment. And then you combine that with high pornography use, you get someone who's much more likely to commit sexual assault. Now that last one may have surprised you a little bit, and it's something I've done a lot of research on recently, um, to take a look at the intersections between pornography and sexual violence. And what we found is that the more frequently someone uses pornography and the more violent that pornography is, the more likely they are to commit sexual violence. Okay, it doesn't mean that everybody who looks at pornography is gonna commit sexual violence. I'm not saying that at all. But the more frequently they look and the more violent that pornography is, then uh, they're more likely to commit sexual violence. And I wanted to share a little bit with you uh, on where we are in terms of pornography use in American society today. And this is, um, these are people age 18 to 30. So a lot of, I would assume a lot of your soldiers are in the 18 to 30 year old age group, correct? Yes, okay. So right now, among men in the United States, 79% are looking at pornography at least once a month. 29% are looking at pornography at least every day. Women, 42% are looking at it once a month, and that, that number has skyrocketed from just a few years ago. Uh, and 7% are looking at it daily. The 42% of women who are looking at pornography once a month, that has skyrocketed largely because the porn industry has, has, has figured out that they have the, the male market cornered um, and they wanted to increase their market, they wanted to increase their profits, and so they started to go after women with various different techniques, and that's starting to, to bear some fruit. Um, more women are looking at pornography. So essentially, we're now living in an era of what I would call ubiquitous porn, that it is around everywhere, and obviously uh, people can access it on any number of electronic devices. Now, what do we have to worry about pornography in particular? Um, this would be the violent content uh, that's included in pornography. One of the th recent studies of pornography found that in 88% of the scenes of the most popular porn videos, so mainstream pornography included one of the activities that I've included up here, um, some, so some sort of violence. And 41% of the movies, um, porno pornographic movies that were surveyed, these are just mainstream pornography movies, there was a, a case of male to female anal sex followed immediately by oral sex, where the essential message is that, that a woman can eat her own excrement and indeed, that's what she was doing. So today's pornography is not your grandfather's Playboy magazine. Um, it has changed tremendously, and it's become a whole lot more violent. Um, if you remember nothing else from the brief section that I talk about pornography, I hope you'd remember this. Essentially, what pornography is designed to do is it's designed to teach violence. So if someone is, is uh, aggressive with someone else in pornography, particularly if a man hits a woman in pornography, 95% of the time the same thing will happen. Either she'll respond with pleasure or she'll have no response at all. So you think about that for a second. Man hits woman, almost all the time she responds by liking it in this movie or she has no response at all. What do I worry about? there in particular. I worry about the kids who are seeing it. Right now the average age is 11 that the kids are seeing pornography. This is the, the porn generation. What boys are, think, are likely to think in, in seeing that is that, well, I guess she likes to be hit. And what girls who are seeing that are thinking, if he hits me, I should like it. That's one of the reasons why I say that pornography is a recipe for rape. Now, not everyone's going to follow that recipe, obviously. But it's something that the, the porn industry, I hold them accountable for. Uh, and I think it's important for us all uh, to recognize. Now, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you a six minute video. 
And this video is um, a video of a young man who committed rape on a college campus. He did it in his fraternity. Um, and I want you to see it because I want you to pay attention to how he talked about women, how he set this particular woman up to be sexually assaulted, um, and what the effects were. And look at, look at all the different details about how he talked about it, because after the video's over, we're going to have a conversation about uh, exactly how he carried out his plan. So if you play the video now, please. We had parties every weekend. Well, that's what my fraternity was known for. And uh, we'd invite a bunch of girls, lay out a bunch of kegs or whatever we were drinking that night, and everyone would just get plastered. And we'd all invite girls, all of us in the fraternity. You know, we'd be on the lookout for the good-looking girls, especially the freshmen, the really young ones. They were the easiest. It's like they didn't know the ropes, kind of, you know, like they were easy prey. And uh, they wouldn't know anything about drinking or how much alcohol they could handle. So, uh, you know, they'd, they wouldn't know anything about our techniques. What were those techniques? Well, we'd invite them to the party, you know, to make it seem like it was a real honor. Yeah, like we didn't just invite any girl, which I guess in a way is true. Uh, you know, and then we'd get them drinking right away. We'd have all those kegs, but we always had some kind of punch also, you know, like, uh, like our own home brew. And... Uh, We'd make it with a real sweet juice and just pour in all kinds of alcohol. And uh, it was really powerful stuff. The girls wouldn't know it hit them. They'd be guzzling it, you know, because they were uh, freshmen, kind of nervous. And it was just juice anyhow, right? So. Well, when you say it was just juice, you mean the girls wouldn't know that it was spiked with alcohol? Well, they knew. I mean, they knew that. At least the smart ones did. The, it was a party, right? Not some kind of, you know, like social tea. Uh, I think they must have known, or most of them did anyway, the ones that didn't have to have been really naive. Well, did you count on them being uh, naive? Yeah, the real young ones, the naive ones were the easiest, and they'd be the ones that we'd uh, target. What do you mean by target? Well, that's what we'd call them. You know, we'd all be scouting for targets during the week. You know, we'd pick them out, work them over during the week, and then get them all psyched up to come to one of our famous parties. Uh, they'd be the ones we'd really work on. What would happen once they were drunk at the party? Well, that's when one of us would make our move. You know, by then each one of the girls had been kind of staked out by one of us, meaning one of the guys would be working on them, getting them drinks, you know, keeping the juices flowing, so to speak. And you kind of had to know your moment, you know, when, when to make the move. You basically had to have an instinct for it. Can you describe what happened in the specific occasion you referred to in your questionnaire? Yeah, sure. I had this girl staked out. I picked her out in one of my classes, you know, I worked on her. She was all prepped. I was watching for her, you know, and the minute she walked into the door of the party, I was on her. And uh, she was really good looking, too. You know, we started drinking together, and I could tell she was nervous. I could tell she was nervous because, you know, she was drinking that stuff so fast. What was she drinking? Well, it was the, some kind of punch we'd made, you know, the usual thing. Did she know it was spiked with alcohol? I don't really know, although she must have after a while, you know, because uh, she started to get plastered uh, in just a few minutes. And, uh, you know, so I started making my moves on her. I kind of leaned in close, you know, got my arm around her, and then at the right moment I kissed her. You know, moved in a little closer. You know, like the usual kind of stuff. I'm sure it was no surprise to her. She'd done it a thousand times before, you know. And after a while, I asked her if she wanted to go up to my room, you know, get away from the noise. And uh, she came right away. So, uh, actually, it wasn't my room. You know, we always had several rooms designated before the party, you know, that were all prepped for this. Designated rooms? Yeah, we'd set aside a few rooms, you know, bring the girls up to once they were ready. What happened when you got to the designated room? Well, she was really woozy by this time, so I brought up another drink, you know, and sat her down on one of the beds, sat down next to her, and pretty soon I just made my move. I don't remember exactly what I did first. I probably, you know, leaned her down on the bed, started working on her clothes, filling her up. How did she respond? Uh, I don't remember. I started working on her blouse off, you know, and I think she might have said something. I, I, I don't remember. I didn't expect her to get into it right away. Did she say anything? Yeah, at some point she started saying things like, you know, I don't want to do this right away or something like that. I just kept working on her clothes, you know, and she started squirming, but that actually helped because her blouse came off easier. And uh, I kind of leaned on her, you know, kept feeling her up, get her more into it. And she tried to push me off, so I pushed her back down. Were you angry? No, but, you know, it pissed me off that she played along the whole way and then decided to squirm out of it like that at the end. I mean, she was so plastic, she probably didn't know what was going on anyway. I don't know. Maybe that's why she started pushing on me, but... You know, I just kept leaning on her, pulling off her clothes. At some point, she stopped squirming. I don't know. Maybe she passed out. Her eyes were closed. What happened? I fucked her. Did you have to lean on her, hold her down when you did it? Yeah, I had my arm across her chest like this, you know. That's how I did it. Was she squirming? 
Yeah, she was squirming, but not as much anymore. What happened afterwards? I got dressed and went back to the party. What did she do? She left. Okay, so what did you notice about the way that this guy talks? Over here. He seemed totally oblivious to what he was doing. Okay, so he seemed totally oblivious to what he was doing? Yes. What else? So, sir, I think uh, a lot of dehumanization. Um, it kind of reminded me of uh, a hunter telling a story of like how they killed a deer, you know? Something Absolutely. of that nature. Almost like a hunter killing a deer. A deer, of course, not being a human being. Related question. What kinds of words did he use to describe women? Target. Target. Naive. Naive. Remember I'm using the word prey? Okay, so these are not things that we usually would use to describe a human being. What kind of words did he use to describe his own behavior? Usual. Okay. Why would he say the word usual? He thought it was normal. Okay. He thought it was just normal, the everyday thing, that, and it's all acceptable. The usual kind of thing. What other words did he use to describe his behavior? Cavalier. I'm sorry? Cavalier. cavalier. He was certainly cavalier when he was talking about his behavior. There's no, no question about that. Do you think he defines his behavior as rape? No, he doesn't. And there's a very important point that I want to make about this. People who commit rape will be adamant that what they did was not rape. They will, be, uh, they will say up and down that it was consensual, and this individual would have said up and down that it's consensual. What that tends to lead to is their friends believe them, because they'll say, I was falsely accused by so-and-so. And they'll say, and they'll actually believe that what they did wasn't rape. It was just something that, that she deserved, and it was just something that should have happened. So one of the things that we need to be careful of is to, is to listen very closely to people who say, well, what I did definitely wasn't rape. It was consensual. We need to get to dig down to the next level to figure out, well, exactly how did you know that it was consensual? Well, she didn't move. She didn't fight back. That's not consensual. So very important that we recognize uh, that. Now, what do you think he was thinking? Let's uh, ask, what do you think he believes about women? I heard something over here. They're, They're just objects, absolutely. He doesn't like women. He doesn't like women, no. He thinks they're there for one thing and one thing only. He does not like women. Other things you think he believes about women? He thinks they do that all the time. He thinks they do that all the time, absolutely. Uh, sir, he had mentioned that uh, even though she was a naive freshman, that she had been at parties thousands of times before. This is, she had done this numerous, numerous times. Okay, absolutely. That, that they just you know, go around and, and obviously all they want to do is to be raped by a senior, um, it, which just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any logical sense. Here's a question for you. Have you heard men talk this way before? Have you ever heard a guy talk this way? OK, I'm seeing some nodding heads to say yes. Um, now, the, the last question I have for this section is, do you think he planned to rape this woman? Yes. Oh, yes. OK, absolutely. How do we know that he planned to rape this woman? Okay, there was a step-by-step -step process. Um, I think someone said that wanted to say a little bit more. I guess not. Okay, it's a step-by-step -step process. How, el how else do we know that he planned to rape this woman? They had the rooms prepped. Aha, they had the rooms prepped, absolutely. Um, what, what else do we know about um, that he planned to rape this woman? 
He targeted her, okay. How do we know he targeted her? Okay, he also groomed her. What, what do we mean by grooming? Excellent. Okay, absolutely. So, so pumped up the party, brought him into that circle, grooming. That was all grooming behavior. Anything else that we know about how he planned to rape this woman? Absolutely. Absolutely. So they specifically made drinks that women might be more likely to go to, and they poured in all kinds of alcohol, specifically to lower their defenses. And really, when we talk about alcohol and sexual violence, that's the one way it's most often intersecting. And that is that alcohol is used deliberately uh, by perpetrators who want to lower the defenses of a potential victim. OK, so what did others do uh, in this situation? Who supported his plan? The fraternity, okay, the whole fraternity. Everybody that, that he was with certainly supported his plan. Now here's a, here's a question for you. If someone in your command happened to attend the party where this rape happened, what specifically would you hope they would do to intervene as a bystander? And why don't you, this is a longer response, so why don't you raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. What specifically would you hope they would do to intervene as a bystander? Okay, over here. Hey, sir, uh, while we wait for them. I mean, I personally would hope that uh, if they would identify some rooms that were prepped or if they were um, in, using the invitation, like, hey, there's some rooms prepped, that immediately we get stopped and uh, notified to authority. Or at a minimum, try to keep an eye on the, on the location to see if any kind of activity was going on. Okay. At least that's what I would do. Okay, excellent, excellent response. Um, over here, yes. Um, I would say, so first of all, Generally, if we have parties like this, it's planned out anyway. Um, so one, if there's alcohol there, is there a plan beforehand? Um, two, if this individual happened to go over the limit, hey, who's gonna take this person home? Mm -hmm. Who's the DD? Um, and I would just hope in general, anybody would intervene because we're taught to always be cognizant of our surroundings. So I would just hope anybody intervene. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. In the back, yes. Call the cops. Call the cops, okay. Absolutely. There's a rape that's occurring and it needs to stop. Over here. So one thing that's uh, pretty clear, they're, they're providing alcohol to underage victims very intentionally. Yes. Uh, so you would hope that your, your soldiers would not be partaking in a, in a party with underage drinking? You would hope. You would hope, but it, let's say that they're there and they are, what, what then do they do, would be the question. Uh, you, you keep an eye on the individual, you know, if you see someone's inebriated, you, you gotta help them out in that situation. Okay, we see someone who's inebriated, we need to help them out of that situation, not necessarily say, you know, this is someone's good time that's about to happen. Okay. Hey Excellent. sir, I got, I got an ad too. Um, yeah. I look at this and I think, well we have, Scenarios like this happening all the time called a military ball and what do we do? We make a real sweet grog that's full of alcohol and And then we have you know our big environment So I think you know what it comes down to is that battle buddy or the leadership that's looking out uh, For our soldiers and that's why battle buddy sponsorship whatever you want to call it is critical um, For you know we could relate this freshman do a private to the unit type deal so there's a lot of you know parallels that we can draw from this but it comes down to you know having a person identified to watch out for somebody else. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, we heard enough about perpetrators for the time being. You can say yes, no, or maybe, but I'm going to move on anyway. So. Um, but let me let me sum it up with this point. What we need to do is we need to teach others first that being this guy is not okay. And second, that we all might be a friend of this guy, and that gives us an opportunity to intervene as a bystander. So important messages for us to learn. What I want to do now is to go through some material about what happens in a trauma survivor's brain. And the reason I want to go through this is that if you're ever in a situation where you hear about a sexual assault happening, there are likely going to be things that just don't make a whole lot of sense. That um, some decisions that maybe the survivor made 
that you can't quite add up, like why would this person do that, that, that isn't very logical. Um, I want to explain to you how the brain and the body react in a trauma situation um, so that you might understand that a little bit better and that some of the situations that you may hear about that deal with sexual assault are going to start to make more sense. Um, and this is, I think, part something that can help us to develop some empathy with rape survivors. Now, I'm going to mention a lot of different parts of the brain, and if I were you, I wouldn't pay so much attention to the parts of the brain that are involved, because who's going to need to know that later? Very few people. Um, but what I want you to do is to pay attention to the process. What's happening in the body that's leading to different things happening? So during a traumatic situation, what happens is the hypothalamus, um, which is a part of the brain, is going to send a message to the pituitary. The pituitary is going to contact the adrenals. We've all heard of adrenaline. That's where adrenaline comes from. And the adrenals are essentially going to tell the rest of the body there's a trauma, release a whole bunch of hormones. Um, and there are four different kinds of hormones that are released at that point. There's adrenaline, catecholamines, opiates, and oxytocin. The adrenaline is going to help with the fight. How many of you heard of the fight or flight response? OK, everybody. All right. Um, so the, the adrenaline is going to help with the fight if the person chooses to fight. Catecholamines are going to help with the flight if the person chooses to run away. The opiates are going to help dull the physical pain. So one of the ways that we were, we were designed as human beings is that there are natural, um, natural elements in our body that are going to counteract a, a reaction we have. So that's one reason why some, sometimes when people are injured, they don't feel the injury right away but they tend to f they feel it like an hour or two later in a really serious way. Well, that's a, lot, a lot of that has to do with the opiates um, that are part of the normal um, cycle of responding to trauma. And then finally, oxytocin is going to be released. That basically will lift the person's mood. So they're not going to be in a good mood, obviously. They're experiencing sexual violence. Um, but it'll help calm the emotional pain to some extent. So they may seem like um, a little out of it, um, and uh, not, as, not as with it. Now, I want to go into some more detail on opiates, because uh, I think that's important for us to understand. The good thing about opiates is it's going to help with the physical and emotional pain. If you think about it, if someone is hopped up on morphine, they're not feeling a whole lot of pain. It's the same natural morphine in the human body. The bad thing about that, though, is it causes what's called flat affect. Does anyone here know what flat affect is? Bonus points if you do. Over here. Blunting of the uh, emotional response or uh, intensity and they just seem uh, very detached and unemotional. Okay. Ex are you a psychologist, sir? Physician. Physician. Okay. Um, <laughs> a, a bl obviously. Okay. So a blunting of the emotional response and it's kind of a detachment from what's going on. So just not, not necessarily being all there. Um, What's worse is it makes survivors seem aloof and uncaring, particularly right after it happens. Um, and what's terrible is people then question whether or not the survivor's telling the truth. So if you're assessing a report about what happens in a sexual assault, uh, particularly um, in, the, in the day or so after it happens, odds are there's opi there are opiates that are acting on that individual that's impeding their ability to feel the, emo the full emotional weight of what's going on. And they may even talk in a way like they're, they're ordering a pizza rather than they experienced rape. Um, and so that's something that can confuse a lot of people, but remember then if that happens uh, to you, that that could be the opiates that are functioning um, to make them seem that way. Now catecholamines, those are very high during a rape situation. They're through the roof. Um, and the good thing about that is it's going to help for fight or flight. Uh, obviously, what's prioritized by the body is to, is to either get out of there or to defeat the, the enemy. Um, so it's very good for fight or flight, but listen to this, it's also very harmful for memory. So we'll think about the, the, the implications for that. Um, the, their memory is accurate, so it's not going to encode a false memory, but their memory is going to be fragmented, and I'm going I'm to go into that in just a minute. Um, what's worse is it gets in the way of rational thought. If you have high catecholamines, you're not going to be thinking rationally. Um, and the point of all of that is if you can't think rationally, you can't act rationally. So when someone is experiencing sexual violence, they're high they have high catecholamines, they're going to do something that just isn't rational. 
um, that just doesn't make sense. So when you're assessing a case, if you're assessing a, a rape case, you're likely to hear something and, and think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why on earth would they do X, Y, or Z? Well, it could uh, easily be due to high levels of catecholamines. So what exactly is happening in the memory center? Um, this would be the hippocampus where a lot of memories are organized and turned in um, to, to, to memory so that people can remember things. Now, in the normal state of things, when someone is remembering a series of events, they remember them in order, one, two, three, four, five. Now, in a trauma state, they tend to remember things out of order. Um, and some of those memories will only come at a later time. So one of the things that, that um, I suggest to people who are, for example, interviewing a trauma survivor is to ask, ask a question like, tell me what you can remember about your experience. Not start from the top, what happened in the beginning. Because if you ask a trauma survivor what happened in the beginning, they're not likely to be able to answer that question. But if you say, tell me what you can remember about your experience, they can start anywhere. And just be patient with them and worry about the timeline later, but start anywhere um, with, with uh, exactly what happened. So how do we act in a traumatic situation? One of the things that happens is our prefrontal cortex, that very forward part of the brain, the adult part of the brain that makes decisions, it's going to absolutely shut down. And what we're left with are our habits. What do we usually do if we're in a particular situation? So let's say you have a, a victim who um, typically when they're in a consensual situation and they want something to stop, um, they'll say something like, um, I'm tired, uh, I want to go home, um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready to, to go to sleep now. Um, if they're in a situation where they're being sexually assaulted, their prefrontal cortex is knocked out, what they're likely to say is what their habit is. I'm tired, I want to go home, I'm ready to go to sleep now. So it's unlikely to be no stop, knee in the groin. So one of the things we need to remember is it's often a, a habitual response that they have rather than what we might think would be the logical response to have. Now, I've, I've talked about the prefrontal cortex, cortex rather, being impaired. Um, what, what happens when we have a high stress situation plus a threat, um, whether that's a, a threat that involves danger or fear, pe pe people literally can't calm down and think clearly. They, they reach a, a, a point where all the chemicals in their brain are going so high, they cannot calm down and think clearly. And what they do also is they lose their ability to control their attention. So one of the things that you'll notice sometimes from a rape survivor is they'll say, I remember that it was 10.55 p.m. and the clock was blue. And you'll be like, what on earth is that person talking about? Well, their attention may have been on only one spot in the room where a clock was, but they may not have even noticed the whole rest of the room because they can't really focus their attention on one thing. They're only focusing... Uh, or they, they, they can only uh, focus their attention on one thing. They can't uh, calm down and look at everything. They also lose their ability to encode stories with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, so again, they'll think of things that happened uh, in the middle first, for example, um, and then they'll go on from there. So the hormones in the body, the point being, there's this, the help is that there's this huge release of hormones that happens. Um, and it helps for the emotional and physical safety of the survivor. That's what's prioritized by the organism. Um, the harm is it makes it very difficult for the brain to save and to remember information. So there is very likely, if you're ever investigating a rape case, there's very likely to be things that the survivor does not remember. Um, and that can be used against them sometimes. Um, and say, well, well, how could you not remember that? That was a key part of what occurred. No. It's a normal part of the everyday response to trauma. So one of the things, um, I've, we've talked a little bit about the fight or flight response, but I want to make that a little bit more um, complex because the body is more complex than just fight or flight. What tends to happen when someone is in a traumatic situation is they notice a threat. And if you think about, think about a deer walking into the middle of the road, um, a deer walking into the middle of the road is going to notice a threat, they're going to freeze, and then they're going to figure out 
do I fight this car, which sometimes they try and do, unfortunately, for our car bills. Um, do I run away um, or do I freeze again? So basically, there's the, the threat is noticed. There's an initial freeze. And then the individual is going to figure out, am I going to fight, flight, or freeze? And they either fight, they flee, or there's a second freeze. And that's a normal part of a trauma survivor's reaction. Um, and, that's, and by the way, that's an unconscious response. So it's not something that someone necessarily physically decides to do. It's what their body tells them to do. Now, one of the other things, uh, one of the reasons why this freeze happens is that there's corticosteroids in the body. That's the only thing that drops. Everything else I've told you, like catecholamines, those are going to go through the roof. Corticosteroids are going to drop. Now, why would that be? That's because the body is working on blocking pain. And so it has less energy, and there's this massive decrease in corticosteroids. And what will happen is that many victims will freeze. So in rape, it's not necessarily fight or flight. It's fight, flight, or freeze. And there are three different kinds of freezes. And I want to go through each of them so that you have some familiarity with each. Um, OK, so with dissociation would be the first kind of freeze. Um, what happens there is the, it, it, it's like the person disconnects from their awareness of what's happening in their body. You might think about it as an out-of-body experience. So they're, they're in a situation where they're experiencing trauma and they're like, I'm not even here. They might talk about, I could see my body from above. Um, I was just not even there. The person's going to look very spaced out like they're not all there. Um, that's one kind of freezing, which is dissociation. The second kind of freezing is the most common type of freezing. And it's the only technical term that I would encourage you to remember. And it's tonic immobility. Later on tonight, um, if you have a chance to go to YouTube and put in tonic immobility, you'll see all kinds of videos of different animals that go into tonic immobility because it's um, common throughout the animal kingdom. And you'll even see some shark videos where sharks go into tonic immobility. Sharks will go into tonic immobility when they see their only natural predator in their environment. Does anybody know what the only natural predator of a shark is? Killer whale. Yes, wow, we know. OK, I haven't been here before giving this talk. Now. No, OK, good. Um, but um, so you have the killer whale um, is going to put the shark into um, a state of tonic immobility. So with a human, they're unable to move. They're unable to cry out. But they're still aware of what's happening to their body. It's, kind of a, it's, it's a pretty scary state to be in. Um, it'll also create what's called waxy mobility in their limbs so that they can be moved around. Um, and they're not going to move their, their limbs back. They can be manipulated fairly simply. Um, they may stare off into space. They're likely to be numb. Um, and they're not very sensitive to pain at that point. The pain is likely to come later. 50% of rape survivors go into tonic immobility. So that doesn't include the other two types of freezing. But 50% alone will go into tonic immobility. And that's one of the reasons why we need to be sensitive to rape survivors when they tell us what happened to them. A lot of times what they'll say is, I couldn't move. I felt like I just couldn't move. I couldn't move a muscle. I was unable to scream or cry out, which to, to an uneducated individual could be like, well, what do you mean you couldn't move? Why didn't you scream and I'll kick him in the groin? I mean, that's what I would have done. But they're not moving is part of a, of a trauma response. And that's important for us to understand. Then the final type of, um, of uh, freezing is, is collapsed immobility, very much like a, a, a possum. Um, it's a, a reflex. Um, and one of the things there is it has a sudden onset, so they'll be absolutely frozen. And very gradually, they'll regain control of their body. Um, but they can't speak or move. Uh, they'll lose muscle tone. And really, they, they either faint or they pass out. So this is a situation where they really can't uh, even move. So if you take this to the next level, what happens when you compare a perpetrator's brain to a victim's brain is this. The perpetrator is, and you think about the video that we saw, the perpetrator in the beginning is going to play nice. Um, they'll be worked, they're going to work to be detected as not a threat, obviously. So what that's going to do to the target 
is it's, gonna, it's going to um, start to put on the attachment circuitry. The attachment circuitry is I might like this individual, I'm okay to be around this individual, not I need to get away from this individual. Um, and it, def it, it uh, suppresses what's called the defense circuitry. In other words, I need to have my guard up. Um, so one of, the, one of the parts about the perpetrator playing nice is it actually manipulates the brain. Then the perpetrator eventually will push some boundaries, uh, first verbally and then physically. Um, and there's this conflict in the brain between the defense and the attachment circuitry, where on the one hand, the, the person may think, hey, wait a minute, I kind of like this guy and I thought he was kind of cool, but now he's pushing my boundaries in a way that I'm not comfortable with. That literally takes time to resolve. The attachment circuitry and the defense circuitry almost have a little battle to try and figure out what's going on. Um, and then, after a while, the victim is going to get this very gut-level fear response and say, oh no, this is actually really happening to me. So, um, if, if we take a look here, uh, on the left, the perpetrator is not stressed. Um, when you go over to the right, the victim is afraid and overwhelmed. On the left, the uh, prefrontal cortex is control, in control of the perpetrator. So the adult part of their brain is working. They're making uh, calculated decisions. The victim has their fear circuitry in control. Their fear circuitry being, um, oh my goodness, what's going on? I don't quite understand what's happening. Um, and then the perpetrator on the left again, they are thinking and their behavior is very planned, it's very practiced, and it's very habitual. Um, with a, a survivor, um, their attention and thoughts are going to be driven by what the perpetrator is doing and their behavior is controlled by things like habits and reflexes. So that's that. How many of you think it might be time for a break? Let's take one. Let's come back in about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, please. So. All right. What I want to do now is I want to give you an example of um, what happens with a trauma reaction in a real world um, scenario. And this isn't a scenario I made up. It's, um, it's a scenario uh, that actually happened uh, in Michigan, about a few miles from Michigan State University about five years ago. And because um, I, I want you to see what this looks like in a real case. So what happened was there was a house party. A number of young men uh, owned a house near a college campus, and they decided to have a party, and they invited a bunch of their friends. And one particular female friend uh, was, uh, wanted a friend of hers to go with her, so she wasn't going to go alone. She wanted a battle buddy, essentially. And so she went and she said to um, uh, one of her friends, hey, you want to go to the party? And she said, sure, you know, why not? So they, the two women, they went to this party together. Um, the woman was about 20 years old, and she met a guy there. Um, and she kind of liked him, and they started to dance together, uh, and they were having a good time. So, so far, so good. Um, no problems. But what he ended up doing was he maneuvered her. Um, this was one of those houses that had a living room, which they used as a dance floor, and there was a bedroom right off the living room. He maneuvered her over towards the bedroom um, and threw her on the bed um, and put his forearm over her shoulder. And so she realized that he was, he was trying to do something with her that she didn't want to have happen. And so she says, no, 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 I don't want to do this. I don't even know you. Um, but unfortunately, um, he was able to successfully pin her down, uh, again, with his uh, forearm over her um, over her shoulder and over her neck. Um, and she realizes, oh my God, this guy's gonna rape me. And immediately, she goes into tonic immobility. So she, um, she is absolutely frozen. She realizes what's going on, but she goes into tonic immobility. She remains in tonic immobility throughout the entire rape. She absolutely cannot move. Um, she's um, completely frozen uh, throughout. Now, he completes the rape, and again, all of this happened. He completes the rape, and what he does then is he goes out um, and goes to a group of his friends who are out there talking, and he says, hey, I just had sex with Jane Doe in there. She's still in there. And these guys lined up, and they went in the room one by one, 
and, uh, and then they raped her, and then they came out. And the next one went in, raped her, came back out. Next one went in, raped her, came back out. And she remained in tonic immobility the entire time that she uh, was, was being gang raped, essentially. Now, her, her friend that she went to this party with, the original friend who asked her to go to this party, um, starts to overhear these guys uh, you know, talking all kinds of trash and um, starts to hear them say all kinds of stuff. And she's like, what the heck are they talking about? Um, and she realizes, oh my god, my friend's in this room and they're raping her. They can, she can tell by the, the words that um, the guys are using that that's what was going on. So she realizes it's time for me to be brave and go in and stop this. And what she figures she's going to do is that she was going to go in, grab her friend by the hand, and they'd run away. Well, that's not exactly what happened. Um, later on when she was interviewed, what the, what the friend said was, I felt like I was lifting a dead body. I was like shaking her, trying to get her to like snap out of it. I had to sort of physically drag her out of there. That's what tonic immobility looks like. Now, um, the friend takes uh, her, her gang-raped friend to the hospital, um, and during, she literally drags her out of the room and drags her into her car. Um, and during the, the um, time that she's in the car, the, the woman who had been gang-raped slowly begins to develop a sense of her surroundings. She begins to emerge slowly from tonic immobility. Um, they get to the hospital. They have an exam that's been done. Um, uh, an after-rape exam, that in itself is, is rare. Usually the person isn't taken to the hospital right afterwards, uh, but in this case it was, and they file a police report um, about what happened. Um, and the next part gets kind of confusing because the police um, wouldn't pick up the kit the next day when they were called about it, um, which is kind of strange. Um, and what the, what the officer on duty said, um, was, well, because she was sexually assaulted by multiple men at the party, the kit would be a sloppy mess and it would be too difficult to figure out whose DNA was in there. Now that's wrong on at least two levels that I can think of, biology and morality. Biologically it's wrong because yes, you can figure out whose DNA was in there. And morally, that how we owe a, res a, a response to another human being to treat them like a human being, that wasn't treating her like a human being. So there are at least two different ways in which that was completely wrong. So what the police did was, is they closed the case. And what they said was, well, she just laid there, so she must have wanted it. No one wants to have a train pulled on them, which is a euphemism for gang rape. So if she just laid there and took it, she must have wanted it. Now that's very aggravating. Um, and I, I believe that not all police would handle it this way, so I'm not here to bash police, but this is the, the way this particular officer uh, handled this particular situation. But what he didn't know of was an alternate explanation. He hadn't been trained in a trauma-informed way. And that's actually why when I hear this story, um, I, get a, an I think of an opportunity for change. I think that yes, we can actually train people, first responders and others, what the trauma reaction is like, and maybe then they can respond in a different way and realize that this is all part of a trauma reaction. It's not that, well, yes, she didn't scream, yell, knee him in the groin, so she must have enjoyed it. So there's actually some states, Illinois, I believe, was the first state that mandated that all law enforcement officers must be trained uh, using trauma-informed training. Um, more and more states are considering it, and, the, and I know that the Army is very much into trauma-informed training. And that's one of the reasons why what I do and what I talk about here is trauma-informed, because I think it helps us to understand those very complex reactions that rape survivors have so that we can best adjudicate cases as they come up. Now, I want to ask you a few questions uh, about what you just heard. So based on what you've heard so far uh, about tonic immobility and, and the other different um, reactions, what are some ways you'd expect a rape survivor to act when there's an investigation going on? So you have an investigation going on and you're talking to a rape survivor. What are some of the ways that you would expect her to react to that conversation? Over here. I expect them to blame themselves. OK, 
hey, you'd expect them to blame themselves. Why would you expect that? Right, because they probably felt like they should have done something to stop it. And okay. if they couldn't, they wouldn't have realized that, and they'd just think that they failed to, to do something themselves. Absolutely. And does that make it their fault? No. Okay. Great response. What are some other ways that you think that um, they might act when an investigation is going on? Okay, I heard shame. Yes, they probably do feel a lot of shame. I think there was a, there was a, there were two people trying to uh, right over here. Confused as to the series of events. Okay, absolutely confused as to the series of events because they they if you remember correctly they can't remember a story with a beginning and a middle and an ending. So their their first thought may be, well, I was in this bedroom and these guys were doing this, and then earlier, or not earlier, but then I was dancing with the guys on the dance floor, and when they talk about a story, it seems all discombobulated. Well, that's how it was encoded in the brain. So the second question I have for you are, what are some things a survivor could say about the sexual assault that to an untrained person could lead to believe that maybe she's lying? Okay, think of yourselves as not trained. And what are some things a survivor could say about that sexual assault that could lead one to believe that she was lying about it? Like. Okay, she doesn't remember what one of the perpetrators looked like, okay? To an untrained person, they might say, well, doesn't even know what the, the other perpetrator looks like. If I were raped, I certainly would remember what the guy looked like. Um, so the, yeah, definitely, that could be one thing that, that we could come to the false conclusion that they are lying. What are some other things that might lead us uh, to that conclusion? It might say something along the lines of, you know, I couldn't fight back. All I could do is just lay there. Um, you know, I didn't really know what was going on, that sort of thing. Okay, I couldn't fight back. I didn't really know what was going on. I just laid there. Okay, absolutely. Things that could, that could lead us, an untrained individual, to say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Maybe they're lying. Back here. Uh, to that point, even further, the fact that there were multiple aggressors, multiple offenders, and she didn't escape in between without knowing about tonic immobility, uh, you might be perplexed as to why she didn't escape between okay. those bouts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there are multiple offenders, how could she not escape in between offenders? Um, if, but if she was in tonic immobility, she couldn't move. Excellent responses. Okay, let's, um, let's go to this final question here. Given what you've learned so far, what are you going to uh, make sure you remember about how the brain and body react to trauma when you're interviewing a survivor? So given what I've said so far, what are you going to make sure is in the very front of your brain, in your prefrontal cortex, when you're interviewing a survivor? This is the part where I'm basically asking you, do you remember what I said for the last half hour or so? Okay, over here. Okay, be compassionate. Why should we be compassionate? Like they may be able to remember specific things, but it might not actually fully be tied to what happened. You know, they're, what they know is pieced together. Okay, there's an, there's an additional reason why it's important to be compassionate. And that is that one of the things that research has found is that when we're compassionate with survivors while they're telling their story, more information is likely to come out. Um, so it's, it's a, it, it just makes sense. Now it makes sense as a human being to be compassionate to someone who's experienced terrible violence. But it also um, can have an, an, an effect on getting more information from them. So both things. What are some other things that you're likely to remember? Over here in the front. Um, fight, flight, or freeze that uh, victims don't necessarily fight or flight, that they freeze. And there's three different types of freezing. So that tonic immobility um, would cause them to you know, be there, be aware, but not be able to do anything about it. And then the um, collapse immobility. Also, so just understanding that just because they don't respond doesn't mean that they're giving consent. Beautiful, thank you, excellent. Ask okay. what they remember, not a sequence of events. Okay, ask what they remember, not a sequence of events, excellent. What else are we gonna remember to do? Over here. I think uh, we have to remember that we need to be patient. Some of those informations that might come about might not be in the right order, so we gotta be patient. Okay, 
patience is, is going to be very important. And again, um, patience is another one of those things that tends to elicit more information in an interview than if someone seems like that they're very uh, strict ordered saying, what happened first, what happened second, what happened third, what do you mean you don't remember what happened fourth? But being very patient and having, some, having patience in particular for long periods of silence, which can be very awkward, um, but are also very important to the survivor to kind of regroup uh, and then come back forward with more information. Anything else you want to make sure that you remember? Yes. Uh, that every case and every victim is different, so don't try to analyze them or compare them because everybody's different and every case is different. Absolutely, every case is gonna be different and every survivor's trauma reaction is going to be different. So we can't necessarily follow a playbook as to how that's gonna carry out. Yes? Um, also to remember that their thoughts and actions may not have been rational. Okay, remember that their thoughts and actions may not be rational. Excellent, that's one of the main points I wanted to make. Over here, sir. Okay, yes? I think we wanna go into it believing them and assuming that everything they're saying is the truth. Okay, so we start by believing. Um, when we're interviewing someone and recognize that it's their own experience and they have a right to say what happened in their own experience. And belief is also another one of those things that if we indicate that we believe them in what they're saying, they're also more likely to give us more information. So all these things are critical. Over here. Yeah, I just would like to add that the, uh, during the trauma, the prefrontal cortex is impaired and you're getting that bottom up feedback and the Amygdala is hijacking kind of the response defense circuitry that's going on there. Yep, absolutely. All the defense circuitry is very much uh, there, but the prefrontal cortex is not. Okay, I'm glad that you all remember all of this. I can tell not only by what you're saying, but everybody's looking at me the whole time. You're not looking down at your phones. Like sometimes when I go to speak to a college audience, they're all looking at their phones the whole time. I have all eyes in the room, so I really do appreciate that very much. Thank you for, for paying attention. What I want to do now is transition to talk about a related topic, and that would be PTSD and survivor testimony, uh, and come up with an answer to the question, what does a changing story mean? And so I know you're all familiar at one level or another with PTSD. What we're going to talk about today is rape-related PTSD. Um, now, you have a handout that um, was on your chair when you came in. Um, this slide got a little messed up in translation, I guess. Um, where there are listed four different uh, stages of PTSD. Um, and I want to echo a point that I heard made over here, um, and that is that every survivor is different. Um, and so not every survivor is going to go through PTSD in a stage one for a couple of months, stage two for a couple of months, stage three for six more months, stage four for a year or two. Um, but what the science has shown is that this is, in general, what survivors tend to go through. And they tend to go through it in order, although some will go out of order of, of different, um, of, uh, different uh, stages at a, at a certain point. So we start off with stage one. It's called acute disorganization. It's also called the emergency stage. And you can see on your handout the different things that could be associated with being in stage one. Now, some of those are contradictory, um, and that's to recognize that there are different reactions that survivors may have. Um, and so that's, um, that, that's essentially the, the stage where their life is out of control, um, they're trying to make sense of what happened, they have a lot of physical symptoms, they have a lot of psychological symptoms, and they're in, um, in an emergency state. That is very draining on the body when you're constantly keyed up in an emergency state. So what is likely to happen after that stage is that they go into a stage of denial. And from my perspective, denial is underrated. And what I mean by that is, is that denial for a period of time can be a good thing because it allows the individual to hit the reset button, to say, I'm tired of feeling so terrible. I'm gonna take control of this situation by saying it didn't happen or that it wasn't a big deal. Um, and so that, that denial stage, which can last usually for a couple of months, they may, they may say things like, well, 
um, I don't know why you're asking me about this anyway, it was no big deal, or um, well maybe I wanted it to happen anyway, or it didn't happen, I recant the whole story. Okay, so lots of things can happen in a denial stage. Now if they recant, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. That can be a natural response to trauma. But what happens after a while is they may end up being in a similar situation as to where the trauma occurred. They may see the offender. Any number of things could happen. And so they tend to then move in to more of a repetitive reorganization phase. This, this phase is where therapy in particular can be very helpful. Not that it isn't helpful anywhere else, but this is where it can be most productive. Um, they tend to re-experience a lot of the things they experienced immediately after the rape, but from a period and a place of strength. Um, if they have good counseling, good friends, um, good family support in this third stage, then they may move into a fourth stage of integration and recovery, where they will say things like, um, I would never wish this on anyone, but it's made me a stronger person. Um, I'm ready to, to advocate for other survivors. I'm ready to be involved. Um, so there are lots of different things that can happen. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you to do the most intellectually challenging thing that I ask you to do all morning. Um, and we're going to do an exercise together that's going to involve that handout. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign you, based on where you're sitting in the room, a particular stage of PTSD. And what you're going to do is you're going to pretend that you're investigating this case, uh, the, the case in which the woman was gang raped at the party. Um, and th that I walked you through that happened near the University of Michigan. You're going to pretend that you're investigating that case and assume that the survivor is in the stage of PTSD that I've assigned you to. So for example, if your um, stage of PTSD that you're assigned to is stage four, you're going to assume that you're, in you're investigating the case about a year or two after it occurred. So maybe that's when the person decided to report it. If you're um, Assigned stage two, you're going to assume, well, this is, it's been a few months, and that's when it's reported. That's when I'm having this investigative interview. And what I want you to do is I want you to write down on the 3 by 5 card that you have. You have a 3 by 5 card and you have a pen. One or two sentences in the survivor's voice that you think she would say. And what would she say about... What would she say about what happened during the incident and how she feels now? Now let me assign you um, parts so that you know which stage of, of uh, PTSD to use. If everybody from here to the wall will take stage one, if everybody sitting in this section here would take stage two, everybody in this uh, section here would take stage three. And then everybody from this microphone over to the wall will take stage four. And you can work with a partner. You only have to turn in one card. The first thing I want you to do with that card is I want you to write the number on it that I assigned you. So one, two, three, or four. Stage one, two, three, or four. And you can work with a couple of buddies if you want to, um, or if you'd rather work by yourself, you can do that. But I simply, what, you, what I want you to do is put on the card, in the survivor's voice, what happened during the incident and how she feels now. And I'll be walking around the room in case you have additional questions on what to do. And I'll give you enough time to do this. It's not something to rush through. So what happened during the incident and how does she feel now? Go ahead, and you can do it with a partner sitting next to you.
If you have questions on what you're supposed to do, you can raise your hand and I'll come over. Can you raise your hand if you need more time? Okay, let's pass the cards to the front, if you would. Am I on now? Yes. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, role play the part. Let's assume that this um, particular incident went to court and that I am the defense attorney for the men who committed this rape. 
Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to role play a closing argument, pretending that you're the jury. Uh, and I'm speaking to you, hoping that you, will that you will find my clients, the defendants, not guilty. Okay? So, um, and I'm going to use some of your words in my closing argument, and that's what this is for. So, pardon? Um, they, to, the, to my knowledge, there weren't. Uh, it was not prosecuted um, because the case was dropped. It's a good question. But I'm going to, we'll pretend for the, for the time being, just for this role play, um, that I'm their defense attorney. But that is a good question. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard testimony from, from this young woman who uh, claims that for whatever reason, uh, the sex that she consensually had with my clients was not consensual. Well, I'm here to tell you that it absolutely was consensual. And I'm gonna use her own words to describe to you exactly how this is uh, consensual and exactly why your time has been wasted sitting on this jury uh, for so long. Now, what happened when this young woman came in to be interviewed, shortly after what occurred, she made several statements. And here's what, one of the statements she made is, it's like it wasn't really me. I was dancing with this guy, I couldn't move, uh, and I don't want to talk about it. Well, that's interesting. So she couldn't move, yet she didn't want to talk about it. Is that someone who's telling the truth? I'm not so sure it was. Now she also said, I couldn't believe this was happening to me. Well, maybe she's just starry-eyed and really wanted to have sex with this man. Obviously, she was dancing with him, um, and she wanted some more contact. She also said, I, f I feel fear, uh, helpless, shameful. Well, interesting. Maybe she just had sex and regretted it the next day. So she said, I have a hard time recalling the details. If she has a hard time recalling the details right after it occurred, when obviously she would have the best memory right after it occurred, how can she expect you all to believe a word of it? Well, anyway, um, she, she had this first interview with an investigator and it's such a discombobulated mess that she came in a second time, and this time was a couple months later. And the investigator at that point um, wrote down what she said, and what she said were things like, why are you trying to make me re relive this? It happened, but I'm trying to forget it. I haven't thought about it in a while. She really didn't seem to care. She said, you know, John Doe and myself were supposed to take a vacation during the fall together. He would have never done something like this to me. Maybe something else happened. What happened during the incident? Nothing happened. It's over and done. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if nothing happened, then why are we all wasting our time? And why are my clients being traumatized by this show trial, which really shouldn't have ever occurred? Well, be that as it may, because the initial statements when she was first interviewed and when she was interviewed for a second time were so different, we called her in for a third time to have an interview. And what did she say this time? She said, I had an unwanted sex I'd rather not talk about it, and I don't want to be in another re relationship. What happened during the incident? I, I'm not really sure. I've been getting a lot of headaches lately because I keep having nightmares and flashbacks of the event. Well, interestingly, she didn't seem to think that much happened in the first stage. Then in the second stage, she said, well, um, nothing happened. And now she's saying, well, something happened, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. Well, that's interesting. Well, we had three such different interviews. Why not do a fourth? And when she was called in, all of a sudden she uses the R word. He raped me. It was not my fault. Where'd that come from? Her counselor? Obviously it didn't come from her. She wasn't just remembering this a year or two later. It happened to me. I want to help ensure it doesn't happen to anyone else. It was the rapist's fault. Oh, finally it's the rapist's fault. She was feeling shame earlier, and now she's saying it's the rapist's fault? I don't think so. I was at a party and I was raped by several men. 
Notice that time after time in her statements, she says, I was raped by several men. When does she say that? A year or two later. When does she not say that? Right after it happened. And we all know that when a woman changes her story three different times, it means that she's lying. So I implore you to find my, uh, my clients not guilty. So stepping out of that role for a moment, what did you notice about the different ways that she, uh, in her own voice, that you yourselves wrote down, talked about the rape in different ways? What did you notice was different among the different stages? I just the recollection of the, uh, the actual event. Because even myself, as you're talking about it, I found myself saying, well, she did say she doesn't remember. Now she kind of remembers. Now she totally remembers. Yeah, she's lying, right? So even you had me convinced. Over here and then over there? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is where the agency lies or where, where responsibility lies. At first, it's either with possibly herself transitioning to none at all, but then in that stage four, it's a very clear recognition of, of where, who perpetrated it and where the agency, whether to commit the act or responsibility moving forward lies. Okay, and the, and the, the agency and her responsibility for it, she, she clearly said in stage four that these guys were responsible for what they did. Um, whereas the general public is going to think that that might occur immediately after it occurred. But that's not what the science tells us. Excellent comment. There's someone over here, I believe. Yeah, mine was similar. I was going to say, with time comes clarity and strength to just say what happened. Yeah. Let's, let's go and talk about um, a little bit more specifically. What was the difference between stage one and stage two? some of the main differences between one and two? I think part of it was uh, in stage one, a lot of the reactions are unconscious and, and they're not able to control how they remember the event or they're not purposely suppressing it. But that in stage two, um, the reaction to that is that they really intellectually want to get over it and forget that it ever happened. And so maybe there's more of an intentional, expressive way of trying to, I just want to move past this mm -hmm. and not think about it. Okay, so definitely in stage two, they want to move past it and not think about it, where in stage one, it was more um, reflexes and, and reactions that they were out of their control. Absolutely. How about differences between stage two and stage three? What do you think were some of the main differences between stage two and stage three? So stage two was, was, you know, I don't want to think about it, I maybe didn't, you know, I don't, want it, I don't want it to have happened. Stage three is, yeah, it happened, and now the whole world's crashing down on me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm remembering it now. Okay, absolutely. Stage two, I don't really want to think about it. I don't think it even happened. Stage three, oh, oh my goodness, yes, it did happen, and the whole world is crashing down on her. Absolutely. What's, the, what's one of the main differences between stage three and stage four? Over here. Properly attributing blame. Properly attributing blame, absolutely. Where does she properly attribute blame, stage three or four? Four, absolutely. What are some other differences between stage three and stage four? Over here. A, a bad or terrible memory to eventually where it becomes just a memory and that memory is now just part of who you are. Okay, okay. So that would be one of, the, one of the differences between how the brain is able to separate out the event and think about it differently in stage three and stage four. How many of you ever, oh, sorry, go ahead, yes. I was gonna say control. It seems like yeah. stage three, you know, you're, you're now having, you know, physical evidence of things that are happening to you that you couldn't control. Whereas stage four, now you have control over what is happening. You understand what's going on. Everything is more organized. 
Absolutely, everything is more organized in stage four, uh, without a doubt. How many of you ever heard the saying, if she changes her story, she's obviously lying? How many of you ever heard that before? Okay, most of you. How many of you, next time you hear that, will believe it? We need to make sure that we're thinking of the science of trauma. And that is that someone who's experienced trauma is very likely to talk about the exact same event in different ways, in different times of their recovery, which can make investigations a mess sometimes, just very, very difficult and, and, and hard to deal with. But we need to have our response be, oh, we have a different version of the story this time, she must have been through a trauma. Not, we have a different version, she must be lying. And that's the main point that I want to make with this particular exercise. So um, what I want to do for the final section here is to talk about bystander intervention. Um, I, how many of you have ever heard the term bystander intervention? All of you. OK. How many of you had training on bystander intervention? OK, all of you. What I want to do is I want to give you some advice on how to talk about bystander intervention with your soldiers um, and give you some of the science behind it with a couple of goals I have in mind. One is I want you to, to feel a little bit more confident that bystander intervention is something that's very helpful. Um, and I also want to give you some thoughts about what you can do with your soldiers in talking about bystander intervention and why it's important. Did you have a question, sir? Because um, we have victims in our formation in these different phases, yes. how do we as a leader internalize what they're going through in order to be the best leader for them and support them throughout those phases? Because sometimes over time, we can think that time heals all wounds and it don't. Mm -hmm. And as leaders, I think it's probably a good conversation to have on how we, throughout these phases, continue to support these soldiers, especially in the first phase where it can seem like they're no longer um, associated with the team and they can be somewhat withdraw withdrawn from it. So. I would say two main things. I would say compassion, and I would say patience. And I would say that that applies to any one of the stages of, of PTSD. That we need to have compassion with the individual in what they're saying, and we have to have patience to help them to get through whatever it is that they're saying. Um, and that we're, we make very sure that when their story changes, when they come out with new information, we don't have that look on their, our face that says, Oh, great, more, you know, now the changes of a story, and she must be lying. But, but, um, but compassion, okay, so you, you're now remembering something different about what happened, or he, whether it's a he or a she is a, the survivor, um, tell me more about what you remember now. And, and doing it in such a way that you're not blaming the person, but you're trying to draw out more information and make them feel supported. Um, anyone who's experienced trauma deserves our support. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, bystander intervention. And I want to expose you to a couple of theories that people don't often talk about when it comes to uh, bystander intervention. And I want to expose you to these theories because they're theories of attitude and behavior change, which can apply to things that aren't just related to bystander intervention, but they're, they can be related uh, to other incidences when we are trying to change someone's attitudes or behavior. And it all comes out of social psychology. Um, and there's been decades of research to validate these theories. And I'll just mention two. This first one is called belief system theory. And belief system theory basically says that if you want to produce attitude change in someone, you have to design your intervention in such a way that they maintain their existing self-conceptions. Now that's a, you know, a whole bunch of $20 words or whatever. Um, but basically what it says is you need to speak to your audience in a way that they perceive themselves or they're not going to listen to what you're going to say. So if you say, well, you all are, are young people, so you must drink all the time, and I'm, I, I assume that a whole bunch of you are alcoholics, so now I'm going to teach you why you shouldn't drink. And you come across with that message, what the person's going to say is, Either I don't drink or I'm not an alcoholic. Even alcoholics tend to deny the fact that they're alcoholics most of the time. 
Um, so that doesn't equal their existing self-concept, so they're very unlikely to, to hear the message. If, however, you said, you're a young person, you're likely to be around people who are drinking at some point in time, I want to tell you a little bit more about how to recognize someone when they're so intoxicated that they need our help and what you can do to help them get to the safe point where they need to be. If the person perceives themselves as someone who's potentially helpful, which the vast majority of the population does perceive themselves as someone who's helpful, they're much more likely to listen. So translate that then to bystander intervention in sexual assault situations. If we basically come across with the message that all men are perpetrators and all women are sluts, um, how often do you think people are going to listen to what we have to say? Not at all. But if we say anyone can be in a position where they can help another individual who might experience sexual violence, then we can stand up, step in, and, and help the person who's in danger. If you perceive yourself to be someone who, who can be helpful, that's going to be very uh, much more likely to succeed in changing the person's attitude or behavior. So that's belief system theory. The elaboration likelihood model is the next one. And basically what that says is that behavior change, and specifically not just attitudes, but behavior change, is most likely when first people are motivated to hear the message. Okay? We have to figure out a way to, to get them to believe that what I have to say is important. Now sometimes we can do that with rank. Um, that, that that can be a motivator, but often we can talk about something that's going to be important to them that they're going to use in the future that can be helpful to them in a time of need. Um, they have to be able to understand the message well. That kind of goes without saying, um, but they have to be able to understand whatever it is that we're, we're saying, and here's the key. They have to perceive it as being personally relevant. And again, this applies to things not just bystander intervention, but any message that we want to send. We have to motivate the audience, we have to make sure that they can understand the material, and they then perceive it as personally relevant. If we say, I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't rape someone, and they don't perceive themselves as, as someone who would commit rape, they're going to basically tune out. But if we talk about people as potential helpers, if we talk about people who can make a difference as a bystander, make it personally relevant in that way, that makes it much more likely uh, that they will listen. So the, the basic goal of the bystander model um, that we've heard about for so long in the, in the Army, and one of the reasons why it's, it's used in the way it is, is its, its goal is to give everyone the skills to intervene or reach out to help other people. It's pretty obvious, but that's the main goal. Now, one of the benefits of the bystander approach is that it educates people at a safe and non-threatening distance. And what I mean by that is, we're not talking to people as potential perpetrators and potential survivors, but we're talking to people as potential helpers. In reality, we may have potential perpetrators we're speaking to. and We may have people who have experienced sexual assault we're speaking to. But that can be a very ego-threatening thing uh, to, uh, to listen to. So what we want to do is find a way to educate people at a safe and non-threatening distance, which bystander intervention does. Um, Another benefit of that approach is that it teaches men about rape while sidestepping the potential rapist persona. So what I mean by that is a lot of men think that when we are going to talk about rape, we're going to talk about them as potential rapists. Um, and that has worked on exactly nobody ever. Um, what we need to do is we need to talk to men as people who can stand up, step in, and help. Um, and that is one of the ben main benefits of the bystander approach. It also makes, the bystander approach makes it very difficult to say, well, this doesn't apply to me. Because everybody can stand up, step in, and help in some way. Some people may have different ways of doing it, but they can help in some way. One of the studies, um, excuse me for not showing all the slide when I was talking through the points. Um, one of the studies that um, took a look at why do people intervene um, which I thought was interesting and might be interesting for you to know is that you know you have a, a potential bystander. They're in a situation they could just then they're deciding do I step in and do something or do I not? What they tend to do is they weigh back and forth. What is my reference group? What are my peers? What are the other people that I hang out with going to think if I do this? And if if the bystander thinks I'm going to gain social status by doing this, they're much more likely to do it. If they think they'll lose social status by doing it, they're much less likely to do it. That's why we need to have a culture of everyone 
who basically says, if we see something, we will do something. So that the norm in the community, the norm in the culture is, I intervene, that's who I am. That makes it more likely that everybody will then intervene. There are other things that make it more likely um, for bystander intervention to occur. Um, the first one is making a prior commitment to help. One of the things I do when I talk to soldiers or when I talk to uh, high school students or, or college students or whichever is, I get them to think about different scenarios that they could intervene as a bystander. And then I ask them, um, what are you willing to commit to doing today if you're ever in the situation we just discussed? So what are you willing to do to commit to doing today in front of all these witnesses that you, if, if uh, you're in that situation, you're willing to do. For example, they might say, if I'm at a party and I see a drunk girl and she's being taken to a room by herself by a guy, I will stand up, step in, and say to the, the guy who's taking her in, not tonight, how about if I help you? Um, and they commit to doing that. One of the reasons why I get people to commit to doing something is that the research has shown if they commit, if they think about it ahead of time and commit to doing it, they're much more likely to do it. So that's, that's something that's important. Having a sense of responsibility for the situation, I think, is one of the things that we do best in the Army. Uh, and, and that would be we are responsible if, if one, of, uh, one of the members of our team is in trouble uh, or one of the members more broadly uh, is in trouble. So having responsibility for the situation is something that's critically important. Um, another thing that increases the likelihood of bystander intervention is believing the victim has not caused the situation. So this is yet again one more reason why we should believe the survivor. Because if people don't believe her or him, or they, don't believe, or they do believe that, well, they just caused the situation, others are less likely to come in and help. So we need to get rid of that particular belief. Another thing that increases the likelihood that people will intervene is that they feel a sense of, I know what I could do in this situation. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't do anything They're like, well, I don't know what I would do in that situation. And so that's why we go through scenarios when we train in bystander intervention is because we want to give them the skills and think about what could you do to intervene in this situation and how would you go about doing it. Um, and then uh, other things that tend to increase bystander intervention, having a sense of self, excuse me, seeing others model bystander behavior. So actually having role plays with people um, where they're modeling this is how we might intervene as a bystander in this situation. Um, have people get up and act it out. I'm not going to ask any of you to act out a bystander situation, but I've done that in trainings before, and that helps them to see what a particular intervention's technique might look like. Um, and then finally, um, perceiving that the victim is a member of the same group as the bystander and the potential perpetrator. That's easier for us in the Army to do, um, especially if it's within the Army incident, um, because we're, we're all a part of the same Army. Uh, we're all a part of the same organization. So these are all factors that can increase bystander intervention that I would encourage you to think about as you talk to your soldiers, as you talk to other staff um, in, the, in the Army about what can we do to actually increase uh, bystander intervention. So I want to ask you a few questions um, and I want you to think about what kind of answers would you be hoping your soldiers would give if you took them through a particular scenario. So what kinds of answers would you hope a soldier would give if you took them through a scenario where there's a party where a guy won't leave a drunk girl alone? Okay, what, what could someone do to intervene in that situation? What do you hope you would hear uh, from your soldiers for that particular situation? Okay, one, one second. We'll start over here and then we'll go there. So for that first one, I hope that he would intervene by somehow separating the two parties you know, maybe get some, some other, somebody else in, involved and kind of distract them, so. Okay, you mentioned several strategies all at once, which is great. So get, get someone to help you and distract the individual. Um, those, those are very effective ways of intervening as a bystander. I heard someone over here, I think. You would hope that one of your soldiers would uh, notice that she was drunk and take her home. 
okay. So you would hope that one of the soldiers would recognize that she's drunk and she needs to be taken home. She needs help uh, in that sense. What are some other things you would hope to hear from your soldiers if you're giving them this particular scenario? Over here. So we work at UTEP, so this doesn't really apply to soldiers, but to like college students at parties. One thing we do is like if it's your friend and you don't want to start a fight or embarrass them, you can just tell them, hey dude, they're towing your car outside. You should go check it out. So he's going to run and check on his car and you can help her out and you didn't embarrass your friend, you didn't start a fight. So that's one example. Okay. I don't, this, I don't always encourage lying, but I think in some circumstances <laughs> it's worth it. I'd rather lie and have someone not experience rape. Um, you know, tell, tell the individual, I just heard that Susie died. We've got to go, whoever Susie happens to be. Um, you know, something that's really going to make them snap out of the situation. Okay, let's look at the second situation. What do you hope you would hear from your soldiers if you took them through a situation and asked them to imagine a bunch of guys are trash-talking women in general. Oh, they're all bitches and hoes, and they're all sluts, and they're all there for us. Um, what if you heard, you know, if, if you were taking um, soldiers through that situation, what are you hoping would then come from that as a good bystander intervention technique? What would your mom say if she heard you say that? What would your mama say if she heard you say that? Okay, great, great first response. Yes? very effective one is for older guys is, hey, what would you do if someone was referring to your daughter like that? That okay. typically hits home really quick. Okay, absolutely. Or something just as easy as like, uh-uh, we don't, we don't do that here. Uh-uh, we don't do that here, awesome. Okay, it's setting the expectations of what's acceptable in this community and what's acceptable in this culture. One of, and, and one of the reasons why we need to confront this is, I'll take you back to what I talked about earlier in terms of perpetrator behavior. If he drinks a lot and has a lot of trash-talking friends, he'll be more likely to, to perpetrate rape. So we want to cut down on trash-talking because it has a rape prevention objective attached to it. How about the third situation where a hazing type of situation looks like it could turn into sexual violence? What would you hope in that sort of situation um, your soldiers would respond with? Over here. Well, in this situation, I would hope that they would have stopped it way before the hazing even started, because hazing isn't in this culture anyways. So I would hope that it would never lead to any hazing or sexual violence. Absolutely, absolutely. What are some other things that we would hope our soldiers would say? You hope they call you. Okay, why? Okay. Absolutely, absolutely, excellent. Okay. Um, so, I want, whoops, oh, did someone say something? Yeah, for me, I would just, I would hope they just would say like, are you willing to be a rapist? Just say the name. I'm sorry, would you say that Just again? Just call it what it is. Like, it, have the guy say, like, are you willing to be a rapist? Are you willing to be a rapist? Yeah. That'll stop the behavior. Yeah. That names it um, and identifies what's going on and what's wrong with it all at once. Um, I want to tell you about a couple of different resources that you can use if you want to. Um, I'm going to try to not sell you my book. Okay. And, and in terms of not selling my book, what I did is I just put it online and it's now a free download. Um, so I just want to let you know that it's available. Um, it's essentially a manual for how you would do bystander intervention programs with either soldiers uh, in a military setting or college students uh, in a college setting. Um, and if you go to uh, my website, if, if you can spell my name, you can find my website. It's johnfobert.com. Um, there's a there's a little um, tab that says free stuff. And you have to put in your email address because I like to know who's using it. 
Um, and then you put in your email address and uh, make up a password and you get into the section of the website uh, where you can download the whole book. It talks about um, rape uh, as, a, as a general topic. It gives specific scripts for how to talk about it. It gives about 30 hours worth of training exercises um, and a whole lot of, of stuff there. So again, trying not to sell you my book, but just trying to let you know it's there if you'd like to use it um, for your own purposes. So let's, um, let's go to leadership engagement if we can. Um, and I'll take any kinds of questions that you have uh, along with the Colonel. Whoops. Yes, um, you, you gave a lot of statistics at the beginning. In, in what percentage of sexual assault cases is alcohol one of the variables? Do you have the data? On that. Yes. Um, it depends on if you're talking about an incident that occurs with college students or not. If you have an incident that occurs with college students, about 90% are alcohol involved. With the general public, it's about two-thirds. Um, but alcohol is, is very commonly used by a perpetrator to lower the defenses of a survivor. Do you have the military-specific uh, data? I don't off the top of my head. Um, I'm sorry. Any question at all about anything that we've talked about? And I, I, I promise I'll give a response. It may not be an answer. Uh, Ms. Fobert, I have a question, um, kind of like a two-part. Who's talking to me? Can you oh, wave? Section. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so the, the first one is specifically for you. Um, and it's, you know, we talked about the bystander inter intervention. And the first option is when we're trying to intervene with a specific person um, maybe engaging with another drunk person where it looks like there's an obvious intent um, to misuse the other person. Um, and so we intervene and then that situation stops potentially. Um, but at what point can we start to think about maybe, so, as we talk to our soldiers about this, if they see it happen repeatedly, what can they do? Um, and I hope I don't distract from that question with, with the rest of the thing that I direct to um, more of our installation leadership. But uh, I've been in the Army, uh, active duty seven years, um, and we've talked about this you know, from day one. Um, and so when I was a lieutenant, we talked about this at my previous installation. And I, I asked a question, and the response I got I, I wasn't satisfied with. But I asked this question again. What are we going to do to really change the culture that we promote uh, even on the installation, um, and I know that some, sometimes this goes up to a higher level like AFES or, or the Army, but uh, AFN, um, we watch dirty uh, or explicit movies on, the, um, on what we broadcast to soldiers. Same thing on Armed Forces Radio um, with the, the kinds of uh, music that's allowed um, or even at events. Um, and then additionally, when we go shopping at the PX, and on any of the shopettes, what's available in terms of magazines and references, movies that are being sold, um, where we're kind of allowing, we're saying, don't do this kind of stuff, but you guys can enjoy it if it's, um, you know, not illegal, essentially. You had a lot of questions in there. <laughs> um, were you wanting a, a response from, from? Just the first one. Just the first one. Obviously, I mean, it's just, I think the second part is just something that we should think about. What, what are we going to do to not be hypocritical about what's acceptable on? What was, what was, uh, I guess with the first question you had, if I understand it correctly, you want to know what if, you know, maybe you intervene and you stop one situation from happening, but if you see that there's an individual where there might be a pattern, I would, I would have the same response that the gentleman in the back had, please come to us. Um, please go to your leadership so that you say, hey, I'm concerned about John Smith because every time I see him around a, a young woman who's had anything to drink, he's all over like white on rice. So how do we, how do we address his behavior before it turns into a court martial? So that's one of the, I, I would hope that you'd use your leadership structure for that. The rest of that I thought um, was very interesting. Um, did you want, do you want me to refer that question to your leadership? You could, sir. I mean, I, it's just something I think we need to really think about, and especially I would agree. what we do in our own lives. I mean, I try to live a, a lifestyle where I, I don't partake of those kinds of things that are 
are uh, culturally immoral, but I mean, I can't force everybody else to listen to Vivaldi and only watch weird Wes Anderson movies or something, right. you know? Right. Well, I, I mean, one of the things I, I would say is I think we can do a better job in the Army helping to connect the dots between trash talk and sexual violence, between um, violent pornography and sexual violence, and help put people in situations where they're making good decisions for themselves. If we, if we have an overly moralistic argument with a lot of soldiers, it's probably not going to work very well. But if we have what I would call the enlightened self-interest argument. So for example, um, one of the things that they found is that, and this is a, a study that was specifically done in the Army, is that rates of erectile dysfunction have gone up dramatically with the rise of use of pornography. Um, it used to be um, among 18 to 30 year olds, there was less than 1% had erectile dysfunction. Uh, that was in the 40s. If you took a look at around 1990, it was up to about 7 or 8%, and that's before high-speed internet porn. High-speed internet porn jumps in, and there's 34% of men in the Army of erectile dysfunction. If you have someone who is, who is addicted to pornography, 60% have erectile dysfunction. Now, a lot of people aren't necessarily connecting the dots. They may say, well, I like to use pornography. Well, when you get in bed with a woman, can you function? And now they're not going to really want to answer that question. But that's something to, to connect the dots for them. Um, but the, one of the things about those who have erectile dysfunction with, with, um, with humans is they don't have it with their porn. They're still able to function. So I think educating people on that more so that they make decisions in light of the science that's out there is important. And that's my opinion. I see lots of hands now. Uh, sir, so um, I don't know if it was my turn. If, if it was, it's cool. I, sure, anyways, go for um, it. So I ask this as a, from the perspective of a uh, someone who potentially could be called upon to investigate a uh, sexual assault case or something. Uh, we talked a lot about how the victims uh, process and uh, go through their their incident and some of the ways where uh, their answers might not make sense to us and everything, um, but. Is there cases where someone goes through a uh, traumatic experience like this and they are completely coherent and they are completely telling the story in a logical progression and then maybe they don't experience the types of PTSD that um, we come across? And, and I feel like potentially as an investigator, just based off the facts that we were given today, if someone came to me and was completely coherent, I might have a tendency to say, okay, you might be making this up because you're not displaying these telltale signs of trauma. And I just want to know how valid that opinion might be. That's an excellent question, and it deals with something I should have said um, earlier. Not everyone will have what's called the trauma response to sexual violence. When you have the trauma response, that's when you tend to go through PTSD, that's when you high catecholamines, all of that. Um, so not everyone will have that type of trauma response. And you will have some victims who come in who are able to talk very plainly about what happened. Sometimes it's difficult to distinguish that from someone who's in stage one PTSD, because there are parts of stage one PTSD where they can be coherent, although they, although they tend to be more flat in their affect. Um, but absolutely, that is, that is possible, what you're saying. And I should have made that clear. Sure, sir. I want to address that fundamentally. Colonel Andy McKee, I'm the Staff Judge Advocate. If you're not a trained investigator, if you're not a CID investigator, you should not be investigating sexual assault. Okay, and one of the things that, as we've gone through the training today, one of the things that I hope everyone got out of this is it's a very complicated environment, and our investigators are trained to ask questions in a way to take into account all of the different emotional states that a victim might be in. Okay, so if you're a company commander, if you're first sergeant, sergeant major, you get a report of one of these things, it goes to the professional, CID. First and only place for one of these to go, okay? Thank you, sir. So I'm curious, in your experience, what, what training or systems are in place in the civilian, either in the institutional side or the professional sector, uh, kind of like what we have in terms of training, do, do they receive this same kind of training? There, um, I, I think the military is leading the way, um, largely because you have a captive audience and, and you can mandate people go to training and they go. Um, you, you, you can't necessarily do that in uh, the civilian world. Um, we are getting to the point, though, where there are some laws, particularly when it comes to um, 
people in law enforcement being trained in a certain way. There are conferences where people who are attorneys and investigators go, where there where they're trainers who will go and train them in trauma-informed approaches. So it is happening, but I think it's happening best uh, in the military, if you take a look at everything. Sir, I have, uh, if I could, and I wouldn't profess to have the answer, but I would like to address the uh, soldier question about what we can do. Um, my personal opinion is I don't think that we're going to be able to remove all of the, uh, the moral things in our world. It's just, it's just the way of our world. But what we can do is try to make, help instill the right character and values into our soldiers and understand that this is an armed profession and we have to be stewards of that profession. And that's something we can't take lightly. I mean, it's something that must be a constant. We must focus it because it's really about character and who you are at your core that um, really is what's going to drive you away from things like that. Um, and then my second question would be, we talked about uh, like hostile masculinity. And domestic violence is another area where we're um, challenged with within our military. Is there any correlation to how domestic violence relates to potentially sexual assault? Um, is that uh, any correlation that's been done in that regard? People who commit domestic violence are more likely to commit sexual assault than people who don't commit sexual violence. But there, those are actually two separate areas of research where there's not a whole lot of overlap in people actually studying it. But I can tell you that people who commit domestic violence are more likely to commit sexual violence. People who commit sexual violence are more likely to commit domestic violence. So the two do go together. Not always, but they, do, they are more likely than in the average population. Over here. Sir, um, <clears throat> not necessarily a question, but more so a comment. Okay. Uh, when we talk about bystander intervention, most of the responses generally are, uh, I want to intervene to take the quote unquote drunk female or drunk person away from the incident. Um, but when we talk about just rape culture and helping to understand the environment and preventing these incidents, if we, in most of those situations, we continue to take the victim away and never approach the uh, suspect or the perpetrator, then the individual may not understand the situation or the position that he's putting himself in to help prevent the mindset and thinking of the next time he's in that situation or environment and how to handle himself. I agree. I think there are lots of different ways that we can intervene as bystanders. Part of that is solve the immediate problem and make sure that the individual doesn't experience sexual violence. But approaching the perpetrator um, and calling out his behavior, I think, is a key part of it. Um, if I were given a choice as to what to do, I would look to get this, the potential victim away before I would approach the perpetrator and try and reform him. But uh, at the same time, I think if we're going to be thorough, it is very important to approach the potential perpetrator. Yes. Uh, sir, you mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation that more than half of the uh, women that are joining the military have had sex or uh, past, uh, they're escaping past sexual assault. Uh, can you speak anything on like uh, the trauma responses for people who have like had past trauma before they come in the military, or is it any different? Um, one of the things is that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, people who have had past trauma are more likely to experience that trauma again. So people who enter the military. Um, having experienced sexual trauma are more likely to experience it again while they're in the military. That's one of the reasons why I think we're having such a difficult time in the military moving the needle on the sexual assault incident rate, is that what's coming into us um, in terms of personnel are people who are more likely to be sexually assaulted to begin with. Um, and we're, we're also getting some data suggesting initially that what's coming into us on the male side are, are also more likely to perpetrate than your average individual in society. So that, that creates for an extremely difficult challenge that the military has. I also think that there's no one who's, who's approaching this problem with more diligence than our US military. Uh, up here in the front. Yes, yes, sir. Chaplain Mitchell. So I just would like to add to that childhood trauma 
in the clients that I see, oftentimes, especially with trauma, they will revert to self-protective strategies that they experienced when they were a child. So if, if it was the uncle that coming in a room and committing sexual violence, and they've learned to just submit, he gets his ejaculations and it's over, then that's a very likely response even a soldier might do, just submit, get it over with, it's done. And it might appear to us as leaders that, oh, they were complicit. And in reality, this is just a strategy that has really kept that person alive or, or insane. So just be mindful of that as well when you're dealing with um, childhood trauma. Well, and that strategy can become a habit, which is one of the things that we do when we're in traumatic situations, is act out of habit in terms of what we've done before. So absolutely. Absolutely. We have time for a couple more questions, if you have them. Yes. Turn the beginning, you showed a statistic where 10%, there you go, 10%, uh, a, large, a large number for the males, and 10% reporting, so that's a higher rate, but all of the examples were male and female. How does the dynamic change when it's male on male or female on male? Um, in, in regard to, to what? The response, is it, I mean, because even the handout is all from a female perspective. Yeah. So how does that response change? It, okay. okay, I'll say a couple things. One is that the stages of PTSD tend to be relatively similar for men as they do for women. Um, however, there are additional things that um, a survivor of male-on-male -male rape is likely to uh, experience and have to process through that are different from, from male-on-female rape. Um, one is it's just it, because of the same-sex nature of the activity. Um, sometimes a male survivor will begin to question their own sexuality um, as a result of the rape. Um, one of the things that can happen is um, because of the, depending upon the nature of the rape, sometimes the, the victim will actually have an ejaculation during the rape itself. And if they do, that can lead to some questions about um, whether they think that, did I just enjoy this? But it's simply some of the physical stimulation that could have occurred. So that can be uh, part of what happens. Um, but the other thing that I would say, say about male survivors when it comes to um, the tonic immobility response, Male survivors are more likely than female survivors to go into tonic immobility. And that's not necessarily what most people would think. The rate is about 64% of men will go into tonic immobility in a rape, and about 45% about of women will. And one of the reasons, from my own perspective, in looking at the data and thinking through it, I believe that for men, it is so surprising to them that what's happening is happening that they've never been raised to believe that rape could happen to me, that it makes the trauma response all the more likely because it's all the less familiar to them to think about. Most women know or have been socialized to think rape could happen, they just don't think it will happen to them. But men are particularly socialized to believe that that just isn't possible, it's not gonna happen to me. So it makes the, the trauma response even more likely. Okay, Colonel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Just a couple things. First of all, I think I've learned more in this session here than I have in 26 previous years of, of SHARP briefing, so thank you very much. Very informative. You know, one of the questions that was asked, and I can tie a couple things into it, was, look, we've got some some bad options out there. Some soldiers can make choices that, technically speaking, are available, say, on an Army installation. I guess, and then the other thing was sometimes it, it keeps happening, right? I mean, how long have we been talking about this problem? For a very long time. Um, now, more so, probably more seriously, when I first joined. So why is it still, I mean, after all this time, with all these fantastic people, and then a while back, I heard a statistic that I thought was important. It wasn't sharp related. <clears throat> Army retention, Army recruiting, we're trying to retain more soldiers, right? And I think, and some NCO, smart NCO could, could correct me if I'm wrong, but what I heard was up to 45% of first-term soldiers eventually leave. 
And if you're not tracking, the Army hires about 10,000 soldiers every month. Every month we're recruiting and taking in to train about 10,000. That's a lot of, that's a big hiring option, right? If you go to some businesses, how many people to hire in a year? Well, 50. I mean, 100, like 100,000. Because the, reti the retirements, the rotations, people PCSing. Now think about that, 45%. So I might be young Sergeant Eichberg and I've got a young soldier in here. And I don't know where that soldier comes from. You know, I, I, my, my parents, what they taught me was like the Army values. But that's not where everyone comes from. And so maybe they've seen it for 18, 17, 18, 19 years. They've seen the wrong way. My mom's getting slapped around. People treat my sister like she's some kind of slut. And that's just kind of the way it was where I grew up. Now that person comes into the Army, and on day one, you got a young, whoever it might be, specialist, sergeant, whoever that team leader is, they are now up against 18 years of experiencing the wrong way. And that's a culture that's been inculcated. And that young leader right there along with the chain of command, but especially young leader, you're up against that right from the get-go. That first weekend, that first month, you're trying to teach the Army values. Yeah, they got some in basic training, AIT, but you're doing that. That is a tremendous challenge. Now, maybe Eichberg's in your chain of command for two or three years, and guess what? He leaves. He PCSs or ETSs, and now you've got a new soldier. You've got to do it all over again. Except the problem is you're probably not the team leader or squad leader anymore. You've advanced. You've been promoted. So the challenge for us is we have to make sure that as we come in, that people are inculcated with these values, <clears throat> that they're taught these values. And for those who will not accept them, they have no place in here. It's not someone's right to join the military. If they're not going to believe and support the values like dignity, respect, teamwork, right, all the things we believe in, they cannot operate here. And we see every day, shockingly, people who've been in the military for a long time, but God Almighty, and they just get busted. You're like, how could they have possibly made it this far doing all that? Because it didn't just start when they got charged. So what I submit to you is what we have to do is make sure our younger leaders are equipped to be able to deal with this right from the get-go and that they're supported. And that they're equipped and trained so that when they become platoon leaders, platoon sergeants, company commanders, first sergeants, they can see this and then train the next generation of young leaders. Because that's where it starts. Because that's what we're up against. I don't know where you came from, all of you. You know where I came from. I do know now we're all one family and one team. And there's a certain behavior that's expected of all of us. Some people will say, well, I don't know if I should say anything. It's not my business. You're damn right it's your business. Absolutely your business. To step in anywhere, on post, off post, that is not acceptable. Now, do you have to be a jerk about it? No, you don't have to be a jerk. You can be courteous and respectful. But what's the one thing you must be? Assertive. You can't sit there and say, well, I'm, I'm sure Sir Major, he'll step in. He's, I know, I'm going to come over here. It's, God, this is so uncomfortable. I don't, like, I don't like having unpleasant conversations. I don't like conflict. Or if you're a leader, you better get used to it because it is necessary. And if you're the one leader who doesn't want to have those, you're in the wrong business. No one likes to do it. No one enjoys it. And it could be anything. But if I won't correct a soldier on a uniform violation, do you really think I'm going to step into a situation like this? Whereas 10 guys ready to gang rape some girl, I'm going to be the only one now who, well, I think this is my moment. Probably not going to happen. What I'll probably do is go home and think, Jesus, I wish someone else would have stepped in. So again, if I'm not right, someone, I would expect someone to say, sir, hey, that you're not in the right uniform there. Or, hey, sir, what you just said was pretty inappropriate. I mean, there are ways to do it. But if we're not going to be willing to do that, for something like a uniform violation or someone has a cadence that's probably not what we would expect, you're not going to walk into a situation like that, which is probably a graduate level difficult intervention bystander and say, well, okay, I'm going to hit a home run tonight. That's probably not going to happen. So start enforcing standards no matter what they are, and then this will become maybe a little bit more prevalent and maybe our younger leaders will be able to expect it more. And in the end, as far as the choice our soldiers make, I mean, for me, I think I would feel better is if, for example, PFC Ferreira, which was like 150 years ago, PFC Ferreira. I'm sorry, I had to do that. If he's got the choice between right here and wrong here, and after being with me for a while, he ignores wrong and chooses right, you have won, at least with him. Now he's got to train the new, you know, sergeant for now he's got to train new PFC. But if I remove this, if I say, we don't even have a choice, well, do I really think he's embraced and taken on that culture? 
or have I just given him no other options? And so as soon as he's out of my sight, and he does have that option again, no one's here, right? he's not here, a pain in the ass, I'm going to do this. So I'd submit to you is, in the environment, there's always going to be a good choice or the bad choice. The one we would want our soldiers to choose, the ones we would not. Our job is to get them to look at the right one and take that and ignore the other one and then help convince their peers, their subordinates, maybe influence their superiors to do likewise. So I want to thank you very much for coming out here again. It's extremely uh, helpful and we learned a tremendous amount. Let's give them a round of applause, please.